Okay, so today we're going to look at working capital and uh, financing decision. And we are going to focus on uh, these areas, define working capital management, describe the effect of asset growth, describe the effect asset growth has on working capital positions, identify working capital management considerations for permanent components, the effect of sales production schedules and liquidity versus risk, identify the cash flow cycle of the firm, and explain financing of assets in terms of hedging. So working capital management, it's about controlling, managing, and financing investment in the current assets of the firm. Remember when we spoke about working capital, we said that working capital deals with current assets and current liabilities of the firm. So the main area that's involved in working capital management is controlling, managing, and financing current assets. So most time, it's it's um, pretty much tied up the finance manager. So it's a very um, time-consuming job of the finance manager, and it's crucial to long-term success or failure of the firm. If the firm, if it manages it current um, assets properly, if it's their finance properly, then the company will be able to, for example, have cash. Um, if not, it may become uh, insolvent, and insolvency could lead to bankruptcy. Now, the nature of asset growth. So the nature of asset growth, it, it, uh, if you look at sales, Sales, increasing sales, for example, sales is linked with production. So if you increase sales, you have to increase production. So there's a cost associated with increasing sales. Equally, when cash receipt, uh, there's a link with cash payment. Right? If you, as you receive cash, you also have to make a payment to your creditors. Now, in simplest case, we, we all the firm current assets are self-liquidating. That means they are being sold off in a specified time period. We generally say that current assets represent uh, assets that will, it can be, it will be converted to cash within a year. That's the simplest term, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, firm will hold inventory over a time period. Yes, it will change inventory, but the, but the amount of inventory that it will hold tends to be the same. Let me explain what I mean. So if you are operating, say, a retail store, right, you are always going to hold a certain amount of, say, um, and let's say in that retail store, you sell uh, Lysol spray. We need them now for coronavirus. But let's say you sell Lysol spray. You always need want to maintain a certain amount of Lysol spray. So even though you are expecting that inventory to go on, but it will be, be replaced with a certain amount of inventory. No. Equally, a firm wants to hold a certain amount of cash so that it will have cash if there becomes emergency or a situation where it will need to have cash immediately, right? So let's say a firm, uh, let's say you're a small company and you normally want to hold about $10,000 in cash. As, and then say you want to increase the business. You want to, the business, to expand the business to make more uh, to, to make more money. To do that, however, you have to increase your uh, your your um, at least your current assets. For example, you will have you may recognize the need to hold more cash. So now, rather than holding 
$10,000 worth of cash, you may recognize the need to hold $15,000 worth of cash. It's equal inventory, rather than wanting to hold, say, $15,000 worth of inventory, you may recognize the need to hold $20,000, $25,000 worth of inventory. So even though we consider these to be uh, current assets that will be converted to cash in a short time period, but also there is a permanent component to them. You are always going to want to hold a certain amount of cash. You are always going to want to hold a certain amount of inventory. So sales and production are unlikely to be perfectly synchronized. So as we said before, that sales is related to production, but they are not perfectly synchronized, right? And it's, it's difficult to, per, to, to synchronize them to make sure that everything that is produced is also sold uh, at the same time. So sales are supported by investment in current assets. As we said before, you may have to make investment in holding more cash or in holding more inventory. Often, so sales are supported by investment in current assets, often require permanent current assets. Right? So you go back to again to what we said, what I said before. As the company expands, the company may find a need to hold more cash and more inventory. So even though we are saying that these are current assets that are or will be converted to cash within one period, it's not necessarily so because you will want to hold that cash as long as you're operating, unless you change the policy of wanting to hold more, or you are reducing the business, or you're recognizing that you may not need to hold so much and want to hold less. But the normal case would be for you to hold more. So it's oftentimes this current asset seems like permanent current asset, because you're constantly holding a particular amount of cash, or you're constantly holding particular amount of inventory says permanent current assets. So sales growth increase the current assets in so sales growth increase the current asset investment. Right? So as a sales growth you have to increase the investment in these current assets. So internally generated funds may not be adequate uh, to to uh, to finance these and you may need external um, financing. So here's a picture that shows your uh, current assets. So at the top you can see temporary current assets. Uh, it, it goes up, it goes down, goes up, goes down. And you can see your capital assets remain constant over time, over a longer period. Right? In stage two, uh, stage B, uh, yeah, stage two, you can see that that temporary uh, current asset goes up, goes down, but then there is also permanent uh, current assets that will grow over time. As the company grows, the current, permanent current assets will grow over time. You will hold more cash as the company grows or you will hold more inventory as the current as the company uh, grows. <coughs> so controlling asset growth and matching sales and uh, production. So two possible production alternatives is in relation uh, to sales. So one, you could actually try to match uh, to use what's called a lever sales uh, production. So what is happening in a lever sales production is that you would produce the same amount every period, right? So it's method smooth production schedule and uses labor and equipment efficiently at lower cost, but leads to fluctuation in current assets. So because you, let's say that sales, sales production is Let's say that sales will go up, sales will go down. Let's say sales seasonal, for example. So during period of high 
uh, high season, sales will go up. During period of low, um, during low season, sales will go down. If you are producing the same amount during this uh, each period, in, uh, say if you're producing the same amount throughout the year, then inventory will go up and, and inventory will go down according to your sales. So if you are operating a period of, of in, in low season, then your inventory level will rise because you are producing the same amount. If you are operating in a period of high sales, then your inventory will fall accordingly. So that's what we call a lever production. Then you have matching sales and production. Now this eliminates um, the large seasonal bulbs or sharp production in current assets, sharp production in holding more inventory, less inventory. So you're matching sales to production. But this is pretty difficult to achieve, right? So for most companies, where levels sale production is the one that's used. So let's look at an example of a company uh, that produces um, and sells um, motorcycles in Canada. And motorcycle sales tend to be seasonal because um, here it's cold during the winter and persons are more reluctant to go riding hence purchasing the motorcycles. Now, <coughs> here is a look of sales broken down um, into quarters and then into months. So in the first quarter we have uh, October, November, and December, and you can see that October there was 300 motorbikes being sold, November 150, December 50, and there's no sale in January, in the second quarter, and February, the second quarter, March, then there's 600 sales. Then in the spring of April, May, and June, you can see sales picking up and as well in the summer, uh, early summer, July and August sales, and then in at the end, almost at the end of summer, the sales again fall. So the total sales of 9,600 units at $3,000 uh, was the total sale over the year, and that amount to $28.8 million. $28 million. So here is a production schedule for uh, the company. Now, we start out with a beginning inventory of 800. So the company is going to produce the same amount each month, right? Because it's using a lever sales production, so it's not going to change its sales production. So each month it produces the same amount, 800. So <coughs> in October, its sales was 300. So you can see it says 300. And so it will have um, a ending inventory amount of 1300. And that ending inventory amount of 1300 is valued at 26,000, uh, 2.6 million, sorry, uh, because each one costs. $2,000 to produce. So the beginning inventory for November would be that 1300 that we ended with in October. Again, we produce 800 in November and sales now was only 150. So 1950 was left and it's valued at 3.9 million. So how many units do we start it out with in January? It would be 2,700 2, because that was our closing in 
December, right? And you can also see that in February, we started out with 3,500 because that was our closing in January. So I'm sure you can get um, what's happening here in terms of uh, the schedule. So you can see that inventory starts to build up in October when sales was low and it continues during the period when there was no sale. And then as inventory, as, as, as sales picked up inventory, fall off and by September we are back down to only 800 units in inventory. So here is a, 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 a schedule of that shows the forecast of sales, cash receipts and of payments as well as our cash uh, our budget. So um, I'm not going to go through everyone, but let's, let's, let's just pick October uh, for now. So remember that sales was 300 in October, all right? And remember that if we're selling each unit for $3,000, then that would amount to $900,000 or $0.9 million. In terms of cash, we receive 50% from the month of sale. So 50% would be uh, received in October, and that would be $450,000 or $0.45 million. And 50% from the previous month's sale. Now we can see that the previous month's sale in September was assumed to be 1.5 million. Hence, we would receive 0 0.75, uh, uh, $750,000 off September's sale in October. So the total cash receipt um, would be 1.2 million. Now, we're using constant production, so we are constantly producing 800 units at $2,000 per unit. So our constant production cost is going to be 1.6 million. And we have an overhead of $400,000, that's also constant, and dividends and interest paid once per year of $1 million being paid in August. Taxes are paid four times for the year, and uh, it's amount to $300,000. So total cash payment would be $2.3 million. So you can see that if our total cash payment is going to be $2.3 million, and our total cash receipt was only $1.2 million, that there's going to be a deficit. So the cash outflow, uh, which is a deficit based on uh, those two, would be 1.1 million. Now, if we begin the year with cash of $250,000 or 0 0.25 of a million, and if we assume that our ending cash funds, we want to maintain a minimum amount of cash of $250,000, then you can see that the cumulative cash balance, because we begin with 0.25 million, would be 0 0.85 million, or $850,000. So monthly loan or repayment would be required. So therefore, we have to borrow $110,000, sorry, $1.5 million. Oh man, what am I saying? $1.1 million. And this 1.1 million is to make sure we clear our deficit of point uh, of $850,000 and keep our uh, required cash of $250,000. So the end in cash balance of uh, 
October with what we would start November with. So you can see that um, in November, the cash balance would be $250,000 because that's what we end November. Uh, we, that's what we end October with. So we'll start November with that same amount. So I'm just focusing here at the cash section down at the bottom. So from cash flow uh, down to the ending cash balance. So I'm going to go to November. Now in November, we also run in a deficit because our payments uh, was two million dollars and it was and, we, and there was only inflow of six hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. So we're running a deficit of one point three two five million. Again, we only have a cash balance of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So therefore the cumulative cash balance is still negative at one million and seven hundred and seventy five thousand. So to maintain our cash minimum cash balance of two hundred and fifty thousand, which would be our ending cash balance, we have to go out and increase the loan. So loan would increase from one hundred and ten thousand by so it would it would increase uh by one uh right so the loan would increase by one point three two five million to two uh, million four hundred and twenty five thousand and the same thing would continue in December, January, February, March, until we say start to pick up, say in March and then in April, and then you can see that we are that you now start able to pay down the loan, and as we pay that loan down. By the end of uh, July, we would have completely paid the loan off, and now your cash balance would now improve. And in August, your open cash balance would become 1.1 million. So you can see what would happen in one period if sales based on the sales number. So if we look at the current assets in the first year of uh, operation, uh, um, you can see that um, cash in October was $250,000. Remember, we, we, we spoke about that here. So the ending cash balance, $250,000. So the same would be for October, November, December, January, because we are maintaining a minimum cash balance of $250,000. And you can see in July that, you can see in in July that that becomes $1.1 million, and in August $2.6 million, and September $2.85 million. Accounts uh, receivable would be, as you remember, you are you collecting 50% of the years of the of the month's sales. So the other 50% would become its accounts receivable. So, for example, in October, we collected four. Hundred and fifty thousand dollars out of nine hundred thousand, so therefore the account receivable would be four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and so the same would apply for the rest of uh, uh, the months in terms of inventory. Remember we worked that out before, so. You can go back and look at your inventory valuation uh, in October 2.6 million, in November 3.9 million. So now we can sum these. 
to give us total current assets of 3.3 million for October and in November it was 4.375 million. <coughs> now if you look at the second period um, for cash, the second year with no cash growth, you can see that now in the second year we would have these numbers for September that's from the previous year so it's September's previous year and now in October we would have similar now because there are no uh, change in sales to the previous year so if you um, look at the cash flow you will see that our 110 would be similar to the 110 that we have in the first year because these numbers are pretty similar because there's no change in sales so they are similar to uh, the first year would be similar to the second year no <coughs> we have in October, we would start over with cash flow of 110, uh, negative cash flow of 110, right? And our beginning cash balance would be 2.85 because that's the ending cash balance in September, as you can see right there. Ending cash balance, September, 2.85 million. So, if you put your, in, your cash flow of 1.1 negative cash 1.1 million but the beginning cash flow of 2.85 you have accumulated cash balance of 1.75 million which would what we would end october with and that would also go in to the period in november and so on Uh, similarly, if we look at, uh, we could do similar things with our current, uh, with the total current assets, and you can see that table down below. Now, let's take a look at the nature of asset uh, growth in the company. So you can see the inventory buildup. Uh, between, say, so you start in October, so the inventory present that blue area, and you can see how that inventory builds up as in the January and February period, and then it comes down as it comes uh, towards uh, June and July, and then again it starts building up again to reach its peak in January and February uh, before it starts falling. And you can see account uh, receivable would be high um, during the period that are closer to the spring and the early summer, and then it gets lower during the period when there are not um, much sales. Also, you can see how the movements of cash during these uh, period as well. So, a firm ability to quickly convert assets into cash is referred to as liquidity. Right? We know that from uh, our previous classes. So. When a firm's liquidity is called into question, often it be difficult to continue business. If the company becomes insolvent, it may lead to bankruptcy. So liquidity is largely determined by the cash flow cycle. Right? Sales, receivable, inventory form the basis for cash flow. But the firm's other activities can also affect inflows and flows of cash. So here's a look at the cash flow cycle. So you start with customers and you get sales. 
right? Now that saves either cash sales or, or credit sales. So if it's cash sales, it goes directly into cash, and if it's credit sales, it becomes accounts receivable, which then gets converted into cash. Now that cash is used to purchase inventory, and inventory is what is being sold to um, make sales. So there's a cash conversion cycle. So managers should pay close attention to the time it takes from initial order funds for raw material until the firm collects funds from its client for finished products. So this time is what is referred to as cash conversion cycle. So first, a company will make a product First, purchase, the company purchases raw material. Um, it will have a period for which it will have to pay for it. So it either purchases on cash or on credit. If it purchases on cash, then if there's an immediate payment. If there's credit, there will be a delay in the time that that payment starts, or, or at the time when that payment is due. Then, the company will then convert that raw material into products, which also takes time. And then the company will have to sell those products and wait and the customer pay. So the cash conversion cycle is the timing that from purchasing of raw material to when it's converted into cash for the company. So a firm's cash conversion cycle, therefore, is equal to inventory holding period, so the period of time it has to hold inventory, plus its collection period. So remember, there are usually uh, credit terms, so there could be uh, a 15-day credit term, a 30-day credit term, 45-day credit term, or the it could be higher. So it's in the firm's cash conversion cycle is equal to inventory holding period plus inventory collection period minus accounts payable period. So if the if the cash conversion cycle is positive, then there is a cash gap, right? And this cash gap require the firm to seek some form of financing. So if the cash conversion cycle is it's positive, meaning your inventory holding period plus your average collection period, that's more than what you are given for your accounts payable period because you have to make payments much earlier than you are holding inventory and collecting it just then you are going to need to seek some financing because there is a cash gap. So here is a linear representation of what we are talking about. So it's purchase, then there is an inventory holding period converted into sales, and then there is the average collection period before it's converted into cash. So these two periods that are shown here with the red is reduced by the accounts payable period as shown in the dark arrow. Now, if if these if the two red arrows uh, combined is longer than the dark arrow, then there is a cash gap which is shown in the dotted lines, which would then therefore needs to be um, so you will need to finance because there is a gap in the time between the inventory holding period plus the average collection period uh, minus your accounts paper period now Let's look at an expanded uh, cash flow cycle. So if we start with our customers and we make sales, right? Sales, 
could be um, in different geographic area. Right? Um, uh, products are different division uh, and customer types. Then that sales either goes directly into cash or that sales go into accounts receivables. And you have you could have different credit periods, zero to 30 days, 31 to 60 days, 60 to 90 days, uh, and, and so on. Then that gets converted into cash. All right. Now, depending on how you are financing your, or if there's a need for financing, you may have uh, marketable securities that are converted to cash. If, if there's a need for it to be converted, to have cash available, or you could have cash being converted into marketed double securities because you find yourself with extra cash that can be invest uh, rather than just sitting down in cash and not earning anything. Then you will have to make your interest payments on your on your debt financing and dividends payment on your uh, equity financing. Um, your short-term lenders, if you're looking for a short-term um, borrowing, could be a bank, could be non-bank lenders or foreign uh, banks and, and other lenders. Then the government will be paid its taxes. So there will be uh, provincial taxes, federal taxes, and even municipal taxes. Now, materials and services, you have suppliers, which are accounts payable, labor, wage, um, labor, which would be wage payable and other expenses that would um, also be taking cash from the business. But these are why used to convert the raw materials into finish into uh, finished goods. So first, raw material go and then goods in process, and then finished goods, and that inventory would what used to generate our sale. <coughs> so a pattern of, of finance and the finance manager selection. External source of funds to finance current asset may be the firm's most important decision. So what if a firm has a smaller sales level? A large inventory needs to be financed and not generating enough cash, as you see in our example before, that as the sales become zero, that the inventory build up even more. And if we may just go back to that, so uh, just to refresh your mind, you can see here that um, January and February, when there was no sales, and even in December when sales was very low, how the, that inventory gets uh, built up. And not until sales starting to pick up that you can see that inventory being reduced. So if there's no sale, that uh, inventory will still have to be financed. So the company will have to make sure that it has adequate cash available to finance uh, this build-up of inventory. So what if the firm finance with short-term sources of funds but is unable to renew the financing when it came due? So let's say the company is using uh, a short-term source of funds uh, to finance a short-term loan from its bank. Let's say the bank offered the company a one-month uh, loan. That will have to be repaid at the end of that month, but the company may not be able to secure another loan. So now the company would be in a dilemma because it would be unable to 
finance its to continue financing its inventory. It's not making sales because it's it's non season. Um, it's it's low season. It's not making sales, but at the same time, it's if it uses short term financing, it may find itself unable because when it has repaid the loan, um, it's unable to continue financing the business. So that's something that a company would have to take into account. So based on that, let's look at some financing alternatives. So one, um, the hedging approach is almost like the perfect approach where you match maturity of assets and liabilities. So what do we mean by that? Matching maturity of assets and liabilities. So if you have assets that um, are financed, or if you have short-term assets that will become material and be able to generate, for example, in your inventory cases, in, in the case of our inventory, if we have that buildup of assets in the short term, you're building up those assets over months when there are no sales, all right? You would like that to be financed with liabilities that are of the same duration. If those liabilities were of less duration, then it may find yourself unable to continue financing those inventions. So matching the maturities of assets and liabilities. And this is the most desirable, but uh, it's almost impossible to achieve. Now, a more conservative approach is using long-term capital to finance capital assets. So you use a long-term debt or equity financing to finance your capital assets, your permanent current assets, remember we have that permanent current assets that are building up, and part of your temporary uh, current assets. Right? So this is a low-risk approach, but it's less profitable because uh, long-term financing uh, tends to be more expensive, interest rates tend to be higher, and also you you're sometimes holding capital or cash that you do not have the but that you that you don't you're not going to need to be used at the same time so you're holding it uh, today but you don't have a need for it until uh, six months time but you're paying for it right so therefore um, it it will be a little bit more expensive, but what it will give is a peace of mind. You would be, you would know that you will be able to finance your assets and not finding yourself becoming insolvent. So the more risky approach, however, would be using short-term funds to finance temporary current assets and part of permanent current assets. So if you use short-term funds to finance temporary current assets and part of permanent current assets, it will become more profitable, but it will it is more risky because when those financing are due, you may find yourself unable to refinance um, the those those um, assets. And if you cannot refinance those assets when those liabilities uh, repaid, then the company could become insolvent. So, the three approaches: one, the hedging, where we try to match um, maturity of, li of assets with maturity of uh, liabilities. Two, more conservative approach would be using long-term financing to finance um, entire capital asset, part of the permanent capital asset. Uh, well, the entire permanent capital current assets and part of temporary current assets. And the more risky approach is using short term funds to finance temporary current assets and part of 
permanent current access. So here is <coughs> excuse me. So here is I'll uh, show you a more graphical view of what I was just talking about. So from the hedging approach, you can see on our right hand side there that um, short term financing is used for the short term current assets where the match the matching both uh, maturity. In the case of permanent current assets, in the case of permanent current assets and capital assets, this is finance using long-term financing, and long-term financing can be either debt or equity. In terms of using a more conservative approach, you can see that what happened is that uh, only a portion of short-term financing is financed by by uh, by short-term financing, and part of it is financed by long-term financing, as well as our entire permanent current assets and capital assets are both uh, financed using long-term financing. So because long-term financing are more expensive, you can see that it will, what the effect will be that it will be less profitable. So the more risky approach would be aggressive and to make to use short-term financing to finance the entire uh, temporary current assets and a part of permanent current assets and using long-term financing to finance a part of uh, current as long-term current assets and as well as our capital assets so a finance manager should balance short-term versus long-term financing by considering one the composition of the firm's assets the firm's willingness to accept risk, the firm, the risk and potential payoff from each financing alternative, the term structure of interest rate, and the volatility of interest. So all of these things would come in mind when the company is deciding on how to structure its, its uh, short-term financing because the company will have to take these into consideration because remember of the potential risk that if a company becomes insolvent, it, it may be out of business. So here's just a decision making tree that shows you how uh, the company could go about making those decisions about financing. So it could choose short-term financing, lease financing, or long-term financing. So long-term financing can be debt, or convertible securities, or equity. And if it's debt, it could be long, it could be term loan, secured loan, or unsecured loan. If it is equity, it could be common stock, preferred stock, or retained earnings. If it's lease, it could be finance lease or an operating lease. If it's a short-term loan, it could be a short-term loan from the bank. It could be a money market investment or it could be sales of receivable and in venture. And it goes further to see how you could break this down. For example, if it's a bank loan, it could be unsecured or secure and so on. So short-term versus a uh, long-term financing. Short financing is less expensive but more risky, right? We talked about that before. Less expensive than long-term financing, but it's more risky. So it's lower interest rates usually. Short-term financing are more volatile. Risk of the fall if sales 
to slow down so because it's it, you have to repay this loan within a short period of time if there's no sale during that time then you it, it, it increase the risk of defaulting on that zone but risk the bank may not extend or renew the loans so those are some of the risks that are associated with uh, short-term financing long-term financing more extensive but less risky so it's usually higher interest rate you may pay interest on funds you don't always need yeah we talk about that already too where if you have if you have funds um you're holding that you may need uh, sometime in the future but yeah you're holding it today then you're actually paying interest on it today so you're actually paying for funds that you actually don't need right now or uh, you have uh, but it allows you to have capital at all times so it takes away it allows you to sleep good at night for example because then you don't have to worry that um, the business uh, may become may default on its loan very soon so firm must decide on the appropriate mix between long-term and uh, short-term financing so here's a graphical view of commercial papers and uh, corporate bonds so commercial people would be short-term loan and a corporate bond would be long-term loan and, it's, and here we can see how each the volatility of each uh, here you can see that in general when it's very volatile that um, for example in the 19 early 1980s that commercial people uh, interest rate how that is far more volatile than the, the so the blue line is far more volatile than the green line you can see that in during when period when interest rates are much uh, much lower and less volatile that commercial paper rate is lower than the corporate bonds rate so short-term finance is lower than long-term financing so in general in general it tends to be lower short financing so that's a blue line so the interest rate it tends to be lower but during period of volatility during a period of volatility it can um it, it, it's, it's more volatile and uh, than the long-term financing so let's look at a, an example of uh, a decision making uh, process so the Edwards Corporation needs to finance $500,000 of working capital <coughs> and $100,000 of capital assets. So it has identified two plans. Plan A would deem to be risky. So it's financing $500, <coughs> excuse me. It's financing $500 with short-term financing. And in plan B, a more conservative plan it is to finance only a small portion of the working capital with short-term money so here are the two plans so in plan a company has a temporary current assets of 250,000 and permanent current assets of 250,000 so the total current assets of 500,000 now Plan A, which is aggressive, is financing the entire 500,000 using the short term financing of 6%. While Company B is only financing $150,000 using the short term financing of 6%, but long term financing of 10%, which is more expensive. Is $350,000 would be financed using long term financing. So, <clears throat> in terms of the capital assets of $100,000, right, long term financing are used in both cases. So, in red at the bottom here, you can see a summary of both. So, Plan A has $500,000 being financed using long-term using 
short-term financing, $100,000 using long-term financing for a total of $600,000. In Plan B, only $150,000 will be financed using short-term financing, and the rest of $150,000 will be financed using long-term financing. So what would be the effect on a company's earnings? So in the case of plan A, because the company is using uh, mostly short-term financing, the effect of, of uh, total um, amount of interest on earnings would be that we, it would reduce earnings by $40,000. In Plan B, because the company is financing most of, of its, its, its liabilities by uh, long-term financing using so $450,000 will be financed using long-term financing, it will reduce uh, interest, it will reduce its uh, income by $54,000. So how do you go towards creating an optimal policy? So the combination of financing patterns of short-term versus long-term and asset uh, liquidity produces four uh, possibilities. Right? So one, the aggressor borrow short term and maintain relatively low level of liquidity. So that's what the aggressive firm will do. Maintain a very low level of liquidity, but borrow uh, using short term financing. So this would be very aggressive and very risky, and the company could find itself uh, in trouble using uh, this aggressive uh, strategy. So, two, the more moderate firm compensate for short-term financing with highly liquid assets. So, so the, a more moderate firm would compensate for short-term financing with uh, highly liquid assets. So most of its assets are being held in more liquid, so it can easily be converted into cash if it needs be. And then it would, um, that's how it would be compensated for using short-term financing. Number three, a more moderate firm balance low, li low liquidity, so it's for low liquidity, but it's also using long-term financing. So because it's holding low liquidity and it's using long-term financing, it means that it will not, um, it's not holding so much of its, it, uh, of its um, it's not holding a lot of liquidity, but it's because it's holding long-term debt, it will not have to be repaying or be looking to convert uh, this liquid assets into cash uh, very quickly. So a more aggressive, the more conservative firm utilizes long-term finances and maintain a high degree of liquidity. So this is the more conservative but it would also be the most expensive. So each alternative represents a trade-off between risk and returns. Right? So as you can see, if you apply the more conservative approach, the profit uh, will be down, but it will, maintain, it will ensure that a company at least maintain adequate liquid, liquidity to prevent it from becoming insolvent. So, an appropriate strategy, strategy is selected based on the company's tolerance for a risk. So here's a table that shows um, different uh, strategies. So financing plan in terms of short, the short term is using low liquidity, then it's risky, but there's high profit and there's high risk. If is using high liquidity, then is moderate profit and moderate risk. If it's using long-term financing, then 
it is moderate profit and moderate uh, risk. And if it's using more conservative financing, then it would be low profit, but also low risk. So in summary, working capital management involves controlling and financing current assets. As sales increase, firm requires increased investment in current assets, right? So as the sales grow, the firm requires to hold, um, to produce more goods, for example, which means holding more inventory, so making increased investment in current assets. Lever production with seasonal sales and cash gap in cash flow cycle often requires require a firm to increase its investment in current assets often with external financing. So remember lever production is that same amount is produced um, for example every month so the entire production for the year is divided out equally um, between the months or the weeks and this though will cause firm to build up inventory in time when inventory in time when sales are low and often this will be need to be uh, financed and most of the time it will have to be financed from finding external sources so hedge financing approach attempts to match maturities of debt obligation to maturities of assets so it is matching the timeline of when those uh, assets will become mature and be able to convert into cash with when those um, obligations of loans will be required to be repaid. Unfortunately, hedging approach is very difficult, if not impossible, to employ. So a firm has to tailor the various risk trade-offs to meet its own needs. So, firm has a number of decisions to consider. Long-term financing may be safer but more expensive. On the other side, current liquidity asset maintains firm's avail availability to pay its suppliers but distract from potential profit. All right. So, those are the things that a firm will have to take in mind if, as it tries to manage its um working capital so guys thank you very much um hopefully you will watch this video you won't so hopefully you will hopefully you will watch this video you won't get too bored you won't fall asleep and we i'll talk to you tomorrow in class as we try to uh, look at some uh, questions. Bye for now.